In this video, we'll discuss conformity, compliance, and obedience, and we'll specifically look at several classic, although ethically questionable, studies that revealed a great deal about these social processes. Now let's start with conformity, which is the tendency for people to alter their behavior in response to group pressures, even when they don't actually agree with the group at all. Much of what we know about conformity comes from Solomon Ash's famous experiments in the 1950s. And the setup of these experiments was very simple. Groups of participants were shown a series of line segments that might have looked something like A, B, and C here. And they were asked to judge which of these segments most closely resembled a fourth line segment, which we'll call X. Now what would you say if you were a participant in this study? Would you say A? That's the correct answer, but would you still say A if everyone else in the group before you said C? Well, that's exactly what Solomon Ash tested, and the results were striking. Unbeknownst to the participants in the study, there was only one real participant in the group at a time. Everyone else in the group was a confederate or a trained undercover experimenter who simply acted like a regular participant. In 1955, Ash found that 76% of participants conformed to group pressure at least once by indicating the incorrect line, excuse me, and participants conformed to the wrong answer overall about 37% of the time across all 12 trials. This is now broadly known as the Ash effect, the influence of the group majority on an individual's judgment. Now why did people conform to an obviously incorrect answer so often? What factors make conformity more or less likely? Well, one key factor is the size of the majority. Ash found that the greater the size of the majority in the group, the more likely it is that an individual will conform, at least up to about seven confederates, at which point conformity sort of levels off and might even decrease a little bit. Another key factor is the presence or absence of another dissenter, that is, another person who disagrees with the majority. Ash found that if there's even one other dissenter in the group that you can sort of partner up with, conformity to these obviously incorrect answers ceased almost entirely. And finally, the nature of responses makes a difference as well, such that allowing a participant to respond privately, for example, they were led to believe that they came late and so they had to write their answers down, it doesn't really make sense, but nonetheless that's what was done. So writing your answers down privately allows you to not have to deal with the social pressures of publicly disagreeing with the majority. And so again, conformity was much less common in that case. Now Solomon Ash's studies illustrate conformity to the group, but what about conformity to social roles? In 1971, Stanford psychology professor Philip Zimbardo conducted a study that sought to investigate the psychological effects of living in prison. Zimbardo recruited 24 psychologically healthy male college students who he paid $15 a day, which is about the equivalent of $80 uh, today. Each student was randomly assigned to play the role of either a prisoner or a guard in a mock prison that was created in the basement of Stanford Psychology Building. Now those who were randomly assigned to be prisoners were actually arrested by California police officers and taken to this quote prison, which wasn't a real prison, but just adding to a little bit of the realism. Now although Zimbardo planned for the experiment to last for several weeks, he ended up having to terminate it after only six days because the guards and prisoners conformed to the roles a little too readily and much too dangerously. On the second day of the experiment, for example, the guards gave every prisoner an ID number and they were required to be called by those ID numbers and not by their names. They forced prisoners to strip, they took away the prisoners' beds, and they instituted solitary confinement and all sorts of other punishments that you would not like to hear about. The guards began to enjoy their power and saw the prisoners as lesser than. The prisoners, in contrast, became anxious, hopeless, with some on the verge of mental collapse. The prisoners showed almost immediate compliance, that is, they went along with the guards' demands even though they didn't agree with them. Now, although controversial in many regards and ethically reprehensible by today's standards, Zimbardo's prison experiment teaches us a great deal about not only conformity to roles and in general, but also to the power of the situation, 
we can conclude that people conform to their roles even when those roles are arbitrary. Participants in the study were randomly assigned to be prisoners or guards. And we see that good people can do bad things when they blindly conform. Finally, this experiment illustrates the psychological concept of de-individuation, which is the tendency for people to engage in uncharacteristic behavior when they're stripped of their usual identities. Okay, now that we've talked at length about conformity, what about obedience? Obedience is the tendency for people to alter their behavior to comply with a demand by an authority figure. Now, in many instances, obedience is useful. For example, we have laws that protect us and organizations uh, that keep society running smoothly. But like conformity, blind obedience can be dangerous. Let's take a look at a study that illustrates this, one that, like Zimbardo's prison experiment, would be impossible to do by modern ethics standards, but nonetheless we'll discuss it because it shows us a lot about social psychology. Stanley Milgram, at the time a professor at Yale, led participants to believe that they were participating in a study to improve learning and memory. This was a farce. They actually weren't interested in learning and memory, but rather obedience. Experimenters asked these participants in the study to serve as teachers. They believed they were randomly assigned to be teachers, but it was all set up. They were always teachers who taught learners the correct answers to a series of items in a task. When the learners got an answer wrong, the teachers were to deliver electric shocks that became progressively more severe as more and more incorrect answers were given, with the idea being that such punishments would help the learners learn. These shocks ranged from a mild 15-volt shock to a dangerous 450-volt shock, which was ominously labeled XXX, and these labels were visible to the participants. Now, in reality, the learners were confederates who were just acting, and the shocks didn't actually shock anybody. But the teachers, the real participants, didn't know this, and they thought they were actually giving shocks to real people like themselves. The results were, well, shocking, no pun intended. Sorry, I had to do it. We saw that 100% of the participants in Milgram's study were willing to shock the learner, and a striking 65%, two-thirds of the participants, continued to shock the learners to the maximum 450 volt XXX very dangerous voltage, even after the learners begged the teachers to stop, complained about having a heart condition, and ultimately became entirely unresponsive about halfway through the study. They kept going. Now, why did this happen? Well, there was an experimenter in the room who consistently told the participants to continue, saying things like, the experiment requires that you continue. And this experimenter was a man in a white lab coat, and people obeyed his orders because he seemed to be a man of authority. So again, blind obedience, very dangerous and a little bit scary too. Now, the studies I've reviewed today illustrate the power of the situation, social pressures, and again, the dangers of conforming or complying or obeying without question. I encourage you to think through the practical applications, the real world applications of this line of research. How might these studies on conformity and obedience help us to understand the events of World War II, for example, or issues surrounding police brutality?